What advice would you give to Russians? Wow. I mean, let's have a go in terms of an answer that's interesting to Western perspective. But I'll kind of play act a bit, right? As if I'm giving advice to Russians, which I'm not doing, because the emphasis of how I speak is always aimed at the Western audience. So not in any order of priority. Um, don't freak out in front of your children, but do be transparent with them about what's going on. Leaving is personal. It's about authenticity and it's about risk. In political philosophy seminars, we often have somebody raising their hand and saying, if your society turns totalitarian and you can run away, should you stay or should you fight? What's the morally correct answer? And the correct answer is that's a stupid question because it's too abstract. And even all of us here who have the context about what's going on with Russia should still feel it's too abstract a question outside the context of a particular individual in a particular town with a particular family, a particular career, a particular character. So no advice about staying or leaving, but one very tough thing to say. Um, you can't outrun the problem. The problem needs to be stopped the problem of the Putin regime. If the problem isn't stopped, it's not stopping with screwing up Ukraine and screwing up Russia. It's going to go forward. It's going to go beyond. Don't think that you can just step out of the game. It's a game with ever expanding parameters until the game is broken. So from that, you ain't going anywhere. That's a thing you need to lose. And so if you're thinking about your kind of moral responsibility to fight this, if you feel like that, then consider that the problem is an ever expanding problem until you stop the Putin regime. You know, this is stuff that's coming westward unless it's stopped. Listen to Natalia Zubarevich, the Russian economist, the expert in the socioeconomic development of the regions. And from her, you will know what to plant in your garden and how to survive the effect of the sanctions. There won't be hunger. So don't prepare for things that you don't need to prepare for. Um, Generic to you and generic to the West is a nuclear warning. So be connected to people who seem to have a pulse on the up and down process of nuclear risk. And if it gets up and then up and up and up and up and up and up, um, and if you can do something and go somewhere, then be prepared to do that. But that's a far-fetched situation, but still be ready for that. Don't freak out if the war expands and Russia attacks other neighboring countries. That's not quite on the cards now, but it's part of the logic of the situation. Don't protest unless you ethically must. There are heroes in Russia. Alexei Navalny is a hero. Karamurza is a hero. Yashin is a hero. Yashin has been doing an amazing job. He is a opposition leader of the younger generation. He's in prison, God knows for how long. And he has been releasing scripts that folks have been releasing on his social media, on his YouTube channel. So it's still as, as if he is talking to us, even though he's in jail. You don't need to be a hero. And I think protesting now is a bit like being on some kind of a hunt and firing a bullet um, when your target is far, far out of range. You'd better keep that bullet for an occasion when 
it might actually be um, in with a shot of being even minimally pivotal. At the moment, there's a big downside to protesting, and there's virtually no upside at all, except that your life might be ruined and that your possibility to be free to challenge the regime when you have some inflection going on that makes protests potentially effective, you're going to be out of action for that time. And you don't want to be out of action for that time. So whatever you think, consider that um, the efficacy of protests now is very, very low. And um, there's basically a, a downside and no upside. And don't listen to moralized stuff from the West about you needn't to go into the streets. That That's just, um, um, you know, a combination of either hot air or just um, moral outrage. That's not practical. I would say get ready for a totalitarian um, devolution. So there's been a totalitarian turn in your country. Um, it's gone 15% totalitarian, let's say. Um, there's no indication that it's going to go 50% or 70%, but it could. These things can happen. So be ready and don't be shocked about that. One thing to do in preparation is to make sure that people you're connected with online, you find alternative ways of connecting with. So if various applications you're using go down, get removed from them, make sure you can be connected with other people. Begin building a bit of a network um, wherever you live just to make sure that if the situation radically changes, you've got people who you're in touch with um, who are um, on the same wavelength as you. Know that many, if not most, people's behavior at this point is going to be pathological. So try to focus on what is going on inside, on what people feel and not on what people say. Focus on what are the fears and the anxieties that are driving them to behave in a certain way rather than what it is they're saying and what it is that they are doing. Don't dangerously challenge the envelope the regime leaves you in which to operate because that's not productive at this stage. It might just take you out of the game for when you later need to be, in fact, um, ready to take some anti-regime action that could be constructive. But within the corridor that's left for you, be very proactive. Um, positive action um, is very, very healthy at a time when you feel helpless about your country attacking Ukraine and your country being at war with you. And of course, I am now addressing that quarter of the Russian population who are sufficiently awake to what's going on. To the rest, I don't have anything to say. So that's, I think, a little bit of a sketch. I'm sure that we could double what we've said, but let's say that that's enough to get us going. Our second question comes from Petra, who asks, given your own mental strength, perhaps you don't quite understand the degree of pain and fear experienced by people not even directly affected by the war in Ukraine. How do we face an existential threat imposed on us by a deranged tyrant? How do we process the atrocities going on in Ukraine without going under and giving up on humanity? Well, I think conversations about the appalling face of a glimpsed truth are always quite personal and authentic, and it's about... Um, distance and closeness in the right proportion that works for you. Um, I don't think psychological strength makes one unempathetic to pain and 
suffering and being overwhelmed because it's not about evasion it's actually about keeping your eyes open and therefore um, you are aware of what's happening and how people feel about it and you can hold that awareness you don't need to put it down that's different to as it were needing to turn away from that awareness so i don't think strength goes with evasion and therefore i empathize um and the other thing that's really important to say is look what's easy for some people is difficult for others that's one of the biggest things we don't understand in our civilization that something might be very 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 easy for me but it's difficult for you and i need to empathize with that and something might be very easy for you and it's difficult for me and you need to empathize with that and sometimes we too glibly go around saying that just because something is easy for one that it should be easy for others and we don't have the the love and the patience here so i think this is very important mm. I think that one thing to say that's positive is look at the Ukrainians. I mean, they're not giving up on humanity. If anything, they are giddily um, getting excited amid the tragedy about kicking some Russian butt. And then we've got to be frank. What the Russians are doing isn't historically unique. It just hasn't happened for a while in Europe since the 1990s, let's say in the Balkans and also also in the West we do react more when it's local and when it's white people you know but the truth is that the destruction of Aleppo is equivalent to the destruction of a major historic European city so there is this history of us outsourcing wars, being able to ignore wars because they aren't happening near our home and to people who look like us. I also think that there are some difficult truths here we can't get away from and that's that Wars are going to be fought not just over resources, but over mystical visions and civilizational purposes as conceived by one side, even though that conception might be rather alien to everybody else. And we're seeing that. We're seeing a war being fought that outside of a certain kind of civilizational vision of Russia's destiny in modern history can't fully be explained. It can be explained to a good extent, but can't fully be explained. And so that's the sort of stuff that happens, you know. And we're also back to the story that we're not going to have progressively more peace. We're going to have different things happening and that history that's going to be ahead is going to be contingent. But in the end, the key thing I feel for everybody is that your level of um, closeness and distance and your level of engaging versus putting buffers in place so that that stuff doesn't come in, you know, um, that's a very personal process and I think everybody has to handle it themselves according to what works for for them what works for your you know nervous system Petra I think that that's always an authentic and personal thing my advice around that sort of balance is to always try to consume horror intentionally that's to say don't let horror seep in sort of passively and inadvertently. So what I'm not a fan of is people, you know, looking at the horrors of 
destruction in Ukrainian cities passively while having breakfast. Um, and it's just there and you can see it with a glance on your mobile phone or with some television screen that's passively on in the background. I think that um, you can engage with horror as much as you like, but I tend to be quite critical, quite skeptical of passive engagement with horror. Horror is something I never want to just sort of come in to one's, into one's physical and moral integrity, if you like. Um, in a passive way. Our next question comes from David and from Galactus Fantasticus. And it's a continuation of more or less what we were talking about before. So let's be a bit briefer now. Vlad Galactus asks, I'm struggling as an open-minded Western to divest Putin's global ambitions and moral depravity from that of ordinary Russians. And David says, Basically, what do I do with these Russians who complain that the price of socks and eggs has gone up as their countries wreaking havoc in Ukraine, causing global starvation, escalating nuclear risk? Mm. Cultures get sick. Cultures even die sometimes. That's not the context we're talking about here. But there's a a lovely little short book by a, a psychoanalytic philosopher, Jonathan Lear, called Radical Hope, about the Crow people in Western USA, a century before last. And their way of life was so radically disrupted that basic concepts that were part of their social practices, like courage, ceased to make sense in their new existence on the reservation. And the radical hope is the idea that one social practices might in time both come to make sense and be continuous with what seems to have been lost, even though there is no indication of what that might even look like or how that could be possible. But anyway, cultures are extraordinary things. And Russian culture is certainly not going to die, but it's sick. And that doesn't mean that everybody's in a bad place in that culture, but it means that it's in a bad moment of historical moment. And we've got to be honest here. Let's not prettify what Western citizens feel. I mean, Western citizens are quite all right for their governments to do all kinds of ugly stuff all around the world. Nevertheless, there is a special tolerance among a large number of Russians, the majority of Russians, for very, very ghastly behavior by their military. Um, in other words, if the military of any Western country was doing this, their citizens would not be happy at all. But Russian citizens at the moment are okay with it. And that's because they're not citizens. They've completely bought out of the political process. It's an extraordinary dynamic of sort of pre or post political existence. And it's difficult to snap them out of it because you've got to ask them, as we discussed in many previous videos on the main channel, especially. Um, and if you're new to my speaking to humans on the Internet, this is the second channel. It's called Chats. We have longer conversations here and slightly more refined, polished and shorter content on the main channel. But it's difficult to snap the Russians out of this because you've got to first make them citizens and secondly, you've got to make them aware of this. So it's difficult. I would just say, look, don't think of it genetically. It's not. If somebody tells you it's some kind of slavery impulse that's virtually genetic to Russians, that's a story that's going to run out fast. 
it's actually a Putin-esque kind of story. And one of the things it's based on is an excessive um, insistence on continuity between the Tsarist regime and the communist regime. And I'll say more about this in the future, but there's a radical discontinuity there. So the sort of pop story, yeah, served until the early 1860s and sort of brutal rule. And we talked about the ultra reactionary Tsar Alexander III. And then it was just the same packaged in a um, Bolshevik wrapper. No, no, no. That 1917 moment when Russia got sort of taken over by basically Al Qaeda or ISIS, it's effectively what it was, was radically different and radically traumatizing. So they're a culture that's in trouble. Um, I think that's even been slightly reflected in my own behavior in the last decade and a bit when that slum has deepened. I've been less keen to travel to Russia. What about Russians who just say that the price of eggs has gone up and it's bad and their socks are more expensive? Look, we say what we've just said and plus we say that at the moment what the Russians are facing is no place to go with um, particular pictures of reality. So in other words, if they admit what's happening to Ukraine to themselves properly and consciously, where are they going to take it? You see? And the way it works is at first a, uh, an avenue is going to appear for them to take that kind of picture somewhere. And only then will that picture become acceptable to them. It's not going to work the other way around. They're not going to wake up to the picture of what's really going on and then do something about it. No, no. Only when there's going to be an avenue for them to do something about it will they then accept that picture. Chris asks, Ukraine's decision to blacklist Rand Paul, Glenn Greenwald, John Mearsheimer, and other American commentators, journalists, political actors who supposedly support Russia. Comment on this, please, what's going on. Well, let me pair this with Zelensky's statement recently that Russians shouldn't be given visas in Europe. This sort of stuff obviously serves Putin's propaganda machine well. It's understandable in the context of war. Zelensky has been a phenomenal war leader. He wasn't a phenomenal leader before the war, but he's been a phenomenal war leader. And he's been getting nine, nine and a half times out of ten. The things that really matter, right. But, I mean, obviously the response to this is that this is inappropriate, this is unacceptable and highly counterproductive. Let's not conclude that it's the Ukrainian government that's doing this. It's not. It's a body in Ukraine. And there are plenty of other bodies and individuals who would be opposed to it. There are people close to this government who would think that this sort of um, drawing up of list is utterly preposterous. So let's not say Ukraine here. Ukraine's a country with a good deal of political pluralism. But it's bad. It's especially bad if you just contemplate for a moment what kind of answer the United States could give to this sort of thing. Well, first of all, don't mess with our academic freedoms. John Mearsheimer can be as delusional as he wants, but he's free to do, um, to do that as an academic. Um, you're not going to criticize our political leaders, excuse me, who have been involved in actually sending support and sending money to your country that would be taken over by Russia now without us. So you're not going to dictate to us who is allowed to speak and who is not allowed to speak. Because we believe in liberal democracy here. And you are way more of a democracy than Russia, but you're borderline a democracy. 
you're spectacularly corrupt and you are our proxy. Without us, you collapse. So no, you're not going to go around telling us who to cancel. Sorry. So that's the American response of an American citizen who might not be impressed by this. And unfortunately, there's nothing we can say about that response. It, it's perfectly reasonable. But this is an excess that is understandable and it's not necessarily going to go very far and it's going to meet enormous opposition within the Ukrainian government. So that's what I'd say about it for now. And moves to keep out Russian citizens in the Baltic states are again something that's not going to spread to the rest of Europe is understandable partly because these countries have the trauma of totalitarian and colonial history these are also small countries it's difficult to be a small country and try to protect yourself um, but no it's again not constructive for these countries to turn on um, oppositional Russian organizations who are trying to operate within their borders and oppose the Putin regime. Um, that's not wise. But again, the bigger European states won't, won't fall for that. So that's a little bit of an answer. The next question comes from Gregory Bogosian. And I told Gr Gregory off in the comments section under the last video on the main channel because I felt Gregory asked some very brattish questions, which I thoroughly and diligently answered but i told gregory that i wouldn't be indulging such questions again so you deserved um for me to be mean to you gregory now i'm gonna have a go at this question that um is complex but it's it's really interesting so let's let's try and um be constructive and concise here so gregory says um for liberal democracies to work do the people actually need to comprehend how public discourse works? When the state raises taxes and says that this is the appropriate or the fair or um, the effective thing to do, do people need to understand that these are not the actual reasons and that they're just placeholders? for them to insert their own reasons. And that's the sort of argument I was making in an old video about populist leaders and how they engaged in discourse and what discourse in a democratic society looks like. Look, this was a big word salad because I, I um, uh, read what Gregory wrote, but Gregory in fairness was actually just restating what I was saying in, in, in the video. So let's simplify this straight away. Um, I think that the answer to your question is clearly yes and that needs to be explained a little bit so let, let, let's do that now when the government does something in a reasonably healthy pluralistic democratic society it's going to justify that action in a way that's neutral, almost bureaucratically vacant, so as to not discriminate between different reasons people might have for supporting or accepting or at least tolerating that policy. So if the government decides to raise taxation, it's not going to say that it's raising taxation because left-wing political theory tells it so, or because Jesus tells it so, or because utilitarian ideas tell it so, or because Islamic ideas tell it so. No, it's just going to raise taxation and say this is effective or this is fair or this is just. And that's not going to be the reason that you expect citizens to have 
for supporting or at least understanding this policy. It's a kind of an abstract placeholder because complex democratic pluralistic societies have to justify things to themselves in very general terms. Otherwise, they'll be speaking to 7% of the population. And now Gregory asks, do citizens understand that that's not the real reason as such, but that that's just a kind of procedural placeholder into which citizens are supposed to put their own reasons? I think roughly the answer is yes. I think roughly citizens understand that when they're getting something they want from the government, the government can't describe it in such a way that, as it were, takes on board all the specific reasons for which they want that thing, for which the citizen wants that thing. Because that would make that justification only available to a very small um, subculture, if you like, in that democracy. And that's not going to work. So, yes, when um, the government tells me you can get the policy you want, I don't then expect them to justify it in exactly the way that I would, given my values, my conception of the good, and so on. So this leads to a very interesting conclusion straight away. And that's that the way I personally justify something can never be the way the government justifies it when it comes to at least a great deal of policy. And that if the way the government justifies it just bridges with the way a private citizen justifies it, something has gone wrong. And here we reach one of the challenges with populist discourse, which is that on the one hand, populist discourse works. On the other hand, populist discourse is incompatible with justifying something to all citizens. Because when you speak in a very populist way, a very kitchen table sort of way, you end up speaking directly to particular demographic. And that's irrespective of whether the populism is constructive or destructive. Populism doesn't have to be a, a good or a bad thing in itself. It depends on the variety. But we've got this problem that when Trump, who I would call a destructive populist, speaks in a very kitchen table sort of way to his demographic, that nobody else in the country gets it except his demographic, you know? And nobody else in the country relates to it except his demographic. And the same might be said about Bernie Sanders. When Bernie Sanders speaks in a certain way, um, it might be that only X percentage of the population resonate with that. So that's a, an inherent problem in populism that populism is something that you've got to have to succeed in politics today. At the same time, populism necessarily precludes you from speaking to all of the population. It's a very, very difficult balance to strike. I think a lot of the things I've just said are false, but they are cartoonish exaggerations that point us in the right direction. Norman asks, what is democracy? Is it a single entity with a political and social framework? or a kind of chimera with a multiplicity of variants. I find it easier to subjectively recognize what it's not, but fail to crystallize it in a single definition. Well, Norman, I, I think you would fail to crystallize what an elephant is in a single definition. So we don't, we don't want that, except just in that kind of rudimentary sense of, can you get rid of your government in an election? Can you go to court and win? potentially. Can you criticize the government without going to jail? So you're quite right that the absence of these things is very, very important. And so we can call the absence or the presence of these things as a kind of banal elementary tag, definition for democracy. But if we wanted something richer and more substantial, which is what would really capture why we are moved and inspired by democracy, we would have to think of that concept in a telic way. In other words, we would have to think of it as something that we're moving toward or moving away from. We're currently moving away from it in the West. 
virtually in every Western society, but not in each single one. And as we move closer or further away, we keep exploring what it is, also knowing that we can never fully arrive there. But when we think of ourselves as getting further away or closer, we'll be thinking of things like each person counting. Each person having a commensurate, an acceptable degree of power to influence their society. Each person having the capacity to somehow touch constructively the way their, their society is run. You know, it's not a democracy if there is nothing about it that you can touch as a citizen and feel, okay, I'm both part of it and I can influence it. So, you see, these are much less yes or no empirical kind of propositions. These are evaluative and normative ideas that are about us drifting closer or further away from um, a picture of our society that isn't even in itself necessarily coherent. It might contain various incompatible and incommensurable components, but it'll always be a conversation of us exploring what it is, exploring um, who we are in relation to it, and exploring what it means to get closer or get further away. I'm going to stop for now because I think that this is worthy of a systematic treatment later on in one of the channels, and I, I promise to give it, Norman. Michael asks, would it be an oversimplification to say that Vlad's idea about how citizens think of themselves as generating knowledge as opposed to acquiring knowledge, how that's about people just choosing to believe something because it suits them without fact-checking or consulting experts. So I said in one of the recent videos that we have a culture in which people jump straight away to knowledge generation, a kind of a bogus knowledge generation, without going through the process of knowledge acquisition such that they lose not just the relevant bits of knowledge they should have acquired, but even the skills of acquiring that knowledge, the knowledge about what it means to acquire knowledge. Um, I think that's obviously right, Michael, but what I would add is that it's not just about choosing to believe something that suits and letting go of, of fact-checking. It's about self-expression. And it's about identity. So there's something very compelling about this idea of knowledge generation, even if it's bogus, because it allows people to identify with not just whatever particular bits of knowledge they're generating, but with the very process of knowledge generation. And that, I think, is on the whole very unhealthy. But nevertheless, there are people in their millions who have no idea what they're talking about, strongly identifying with their own ongoing evaluations of the world, which I actually compare to a kind of expressive identity expressing process like shopping. So, yes, it's the ease of just believing what you want to believe, wishful thinking and so on. But beyond that, it's also something that's very importantly tied with authenticity, tied with self-expression, tied with identity. And that's why I think that this business of knowledge generation is so difficult to stop. The information environment is obviously inspiring people to go on that way. Um, but it's inspiring not just a kind of behavior, but a kind of self-conception in them. Um, self-conception that this 
way of going on is really an important part of who they are. And when you object to stuff they say based on not knowing anything about the issue they're talking about and not even knowing what it means to acquire knowledge about issues of that kind, when you challenge them, um, it fails to be the kind of challenge that, as it were, has the potential, if it's the correct kind of challenge, to improve their character. So actually they say, well, now I'm going to be better at making sense of the world. It's a challenge that they take as an attack on their identity. Jonathan Swift UK asks, I'd love to hear your view about Steven Pinker. Well, I'll do an episode about several folks and Pinker will be included there. And it might be an episode about scientism, which is the idea that it's not just science that's great, which it of course is, but that science is great at explaining absolutely everything. So it's the idea that all explanation is going to be eventually reducible to scientific explanation. And that's, of course, not what Steven Pinker necessarily thinks, but there are tendencies of that kind in his thought. Something else that I'll be criticizing is the tendency of evolutionary psychologists to oscillate between saying here is where we're at given the evolution that preceded this place spot that we're at but that at the same time we can transcend where evolution has landed us by some kind of means or other and Steven Pinker has a history of saying that that's an extraordinarily superficial and sort of shallow um, psychology of transcendence that you often see attached to um, evolutionary psychology type pictures of what human beings are like. And you also see the same kind of fatuous ideas of transcendence in Richard Dawkins, um, who says, this is how we have evolved, but now we can use our rational faculties to some degree transcend this. Um, the broad point here is that you mustn't think that the intellectuals who are in the public eye at the top you know, of the popular discourse in your culture are serious as opposed to pop figures. Um, the chances are almost all the intellectuals you know are pop figures. They are um, as egregious as they might find that categorization, um, at least to some extent, entertainers. So we'll say more about that, but no, my view of Pinker is not high. Uh, my personal view of him, I think, is sympathetic and he's always going to be welcome for dinner, as it were. But um, no, I don't think that he has a consistent record of thinking seriously. Boyan asks, hey, Vlad, when it comes to pessimism and optimism, how do you think our civilization will progress in the next few hundred years? Well, that's really difficult to respond to briefly. So let me just put one little nugget on the table. I believe in the cumulative progress in scientific knowledge, in technical matters and in technological matters. But I don't believe in moral progress or in political progress. So there is no reason, in my view, to expect that our political institutions will be in better shape a hundred years from now than they are today. So there's a lot more to say, I think, than that. But this is all I'm going to put on the table for the moment, if you will allow me to be so brief, because basically I want to say that there is going to be no moral or political progress except just how history blows us about in the wind. And, of course, increasingly, we're going to have global vulnerabilities and global challenges above all the climate crisis that we're going to have to deal with. So it 
isn't possible, in my view, to arrive at a situation at any point in the future where we have, as it were, simply solved the problems of politics or simply solved the problems of morality. In other words, if these things are going to be solved, they're going to be solved in relation to beings whose psychology doesn't have much resemblance to the psychology of human beings. So the only way to solve the problems of politics and ethics is to get rid of human beings or replace them. Jakob asks, could you say a little bit more about that contradiction you mentioned about your own emotional world, Vlad, where you say that you're an optimist in personal life, but a pessimist about the world or a pessimist politically? Well, I'm sure I'll find myself many other times describing why I am a, an optimist personally and why um, I'm happy, even though my life is difficult and I'm sort of even now operating with three to four hours instead of 16 per day because of my health condition. But I'm immensely and intensely happy and there is magic in my life every single day. But the stuff about the world, I think one kind of conversation is about a kind of pessimism of strength, which Nietzsche talked about. And that's the idea of looking at things as they are with eyes wide open and realizing that they are what they are, that you can't really separate the good stuff from the bad stuff, that they're constitutively connected, and that if you wanted to get rid of lots of bad stuff, in the end, you'd have to get rid of human beings. So let's take something very, very benign compared to the horrors of war. Let's just take superficiality, you know, people liking bubble gum instead of Aristotle. Well, to want a world in which people like Aristotle and not bubblegum is for me misanthropy. It's for me to want a world without human beings because that's what we would need to do to the world. We need to rid it of human beings to bring it about that there aren't human beings who prefer bubblegum to Aristotle. And so it would be completely against my inherent positive disposition to my species um, to want to, you know, impose Aristotle on all of the people who prefer bubblegum. And that's really that, in a way, the world as it is shouldn't be in every way bridged with the world as it might be or the world as it should be.